petits points rapides. Euh, le premier, c'est sur la, la répartition de la valeur ajoutée sur la, la, la filière commerce équitable par rapport euh, à une filière classique. Donc, quelle est la, la part qui revient euh, aux différents acteurs sur cette filière, donc producteurs, intermédiaires et, et euh, importateurs et, et, et détaillants, entre donc, un produit commerce équitable et un produit euh, classique Deuxième point, est-ce que euh, le développement du commerce équitable modifie euh, de façon importante les schémas de financement, notamment par rapport au microcrédit Est-ce qu'il y, est qu y a des éléments par rapport à, à ce point Voilà, je, 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 je m'arrête là. I'm going to take two or three. The gentleman here was ask, asking. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, of my questions, only one can be specifically directed to uh, a, a speaker who dealt with certification. Let me start with that. Uh, oh, by the way, my name is Makabanyani. Uh, from the South African Embassy. I'm a councillor in agriculture. Uh, I is fair trade worth legislating in, I in governments or in countries where retailers do not voluntarily embrace it? Uh, uh, is there any legislative precedent to that effect? And uh, uh, given that the, the, the this topic of this panel specifically speaks to one goal, uh, one millennium goal, poverty reduction, uh, where, where countries have pledged. Is it worth legislating considering that? And then the other thing is, is there an income threshold or a business development level at which a producer graduates from fair trade uh, uh, benefits? Uh, another one uh, is a comment more than a question. Uh, food miles. The burden to reduce them I in some instances lies with the producers. Um, I and I would argue they would. Oops. Uh, sh should I, uh, I, I would rather argue. Am I still on? on Uh, uh, <laughs> I would argue that 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 burden goes through the transport and logistics companies in state, uh, uh, and I see two options to go out of that. That is, for a producer in the Caribbean to relocate to come closer to the consumer in Europe, <laughs> or secondly in order to reduce the food miles. <laughs> or, or, or secondly, the other option is for the transport and logistics companies to be somehow encouraged, I don't want to say forced, encouraged to invest in research to build quieter and uh, more efficient engines. Uh, so, so the burden is shifted to them. Then the last one, <laughs> I, I wonder if, if, if uh, th this, this uh, talks about child labor. How does child labor limit the potential benefits of fair trade? Um, considering that in other countries, child labor is not considered child labor like it is in the Western countries. Thank you. Okay, well, we had, f we had quite a lot of questions there. If I've got other people. We're going to have to take them. I'm going to ask for the added value. Who can, on the panel, can add who gets what proportion of the profits, I think, of, of the product on the fair trade label chain compared to the classic one? Um, Stephanie, can you answer that one? Um, yes. No, it's, um, it's not something that is easy to answer because uh, many supermarkets, that's the most difficult information to get if you're a researcher and I know I've spent 10 years trying to get it um, they don't like giving out commercially sensitive information but and and again it varies a lot by commodity and by product group 
But it, as a general rule, what's happened over the last 10 to 20 years under supermarkets is that they've put increasing downward pressure on prices to suppliers and increased the percentage of the total value that goes to the consumer end, which is why the branding is so important to them and focusing on the consumer market is so important to them. Um, and this is a big issue in mainstream um, supply chains for producers, especially small producers who face this downward pressure. Of course, just in the last year or so, you've begun to see a reversal, but that's because of uh, changes on the international markets. What fair trade does, exactly as was shown um, in the earlier presentation, is it provides a minimum floor below which that pr downward pressure cannot go any further. So fair trade producers are guaranteed in that downward pressure that they will only reach a certain, uh, th that it'll go no f below, no further below a floor. But from the standpoint of the retailers, they are then able to charge a higher price. So therefore, um, and there has been some work on this and criticism of retailers, the actual share of the total value still for them is quite good. Um, and so this is part of the commercial struggle, if you like, or tension between the mainstream retailing and the fair trade. Organizations like Flow, Fair Trade Foundation, um, and the other, and the producer groups play an important role in the bargaining process between, uh, in the negotiation as to what finally goes to, in terms of the price and what goes to producers. But it's not an easy question to answer. Okay, then there's a question about microfinance. Who can, about the role of microfinance, anybody? Yeah. Annie, maybe you could take that one, Annie, then. Annie, if you could take the microfinance and also the legislative issue about is it worth legislating because we have, have we been having that debate in the European Parliament? Um, you posed only very complicated and complex questions, so it's going to be a challenge to try and answer them uh, so briefly. About microfinance, I'm not an expert on this. What I can tell you is there are several ethical uh, finance institutions that have discovered the fair trade uh, um, supply chain as a target group and they help to giving this particularly payment in advance to the producer organizations uh, in cooperation with the fair trade companies in the north with specialized fair trade importers or other NGO uh, actors as well. So there, um, there is a, 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 an in, uh, there's a lot of work going into exactly this area because it's so essential for helping small producers to uh, buy inputs uh, but I, I don't know any more details, so if anybody else can complement that, that's uh, very much appreciated. About the legislation, <laughs> another very uh, big subject, um, there is a debate about uh, regulating fair trade, yes or no. The first answer is there is uh, not a legislation, but there is a lot of regulation in the fair trade system because we have international fair trade standards. They regulate the fair trade market and the compliance. There's a certification system in place uh, as well uh, on two different grounds. So there is a lot of uh, regulation, internal private regulation, if you like. Lotta said at the outset that at the European Union level, there is no interest uh, in regulating because there are many, many questions to regulating uh, what is at the moment a very, very successful private initiative. So you can achieve some things, but you may also create negative uh, impacts which nobody wants. For instance, greater bureaucracy. If you look at the organic regulation, the costs associated to organic certification have definitely increased because of the bureaucracy which had to be established uh, in in compli to comply with the EU uh, requirements, etc. Uh, another big question is, if we have international standards now, had we a European regulation, uh, it would that really add a benefit? Or if it would it create an, a European set of standards, which may even be in conflict with the international set of standards? So there are loads of questions to that. But at the same time, there are also some initiatives in some European member states, particularly in France, uh, less um, advanced in Belgium and Italy, where particularly the confusion on the market <coughs> and the proliferation of different ethical schemes of which some call themselves fair trade or fair trade similar without complying with these standards has led to, uh, to the 
decision makers to, uh, to decide that there needs to be clarity and that needs to be done by, uh, by publishing a law on that, which is a not binding law for the moment. So there's a different, uh, there are different things going on and different views on this question and there's no answer to that question at the moment. And then there was the child, yeah, I can see, we're going to we'll take another round in a moment. The child labour question, maybe um, Gelke, but briefly please, because there's lots of people who want to ask questions. And um, in the standards, the mention to child labour is to avoid the worst forms of child labour. And of course, there's a recognition of the important part that children play in the family structure, and when you have high season that the children work in the farm and help their parents. Um, but what we try to avoid is that these activities jeopardize the schooling of the children. Um, so it, each case is looked individually and then you have to see how the conditions are given. But what we try to avoid is that, that you have forced labor, that children have to work 14 hours a day and that they cannot go to school. So of course recognize that the, that the conditions are different from country to country and we try to see how, how children can, be, can still combine these activities with schooling. Okay, I saw somebody, uh, this gentleman here, here, and then there, and there was a, a lady there, and then there. But one question each, we're not having four or five each now because there's not enough time. So there'll be a coffee break, you can pick up then. Um, you can talk then. On microfinance, there's a paper at the back actually for the person who asked that question. Um, on microfinance and the link with fair trade. So the gentleman here first, yes. Thank you, Chair. I'm a councillor at the Embassy of Ghana. My question maybe is specifically to the one, uh, flow, maybe. Uh, how fair would fair trade be to a producer, say, in country B, who has met all the standards of a fair trade product, not uh, willingly, maybe through government legislation on environment and uh, labor standards, but does not benefit from a fair trade price simply because he hasn't got fair trade labeling. Doesn't this introduce maybe some element of uh, unfair competition? Okay, and then at the back there was one. Uh, my, my question relates not, that relates to the issue, sorry, Paul Goodison. Um, my question relates to the challenges of this labeling for commercial companies, since commercial companies seem to be getting much more into, into uh, direct relationships on uh, on fair trade products. For example, the Tate and Lyle example. And you spoke about traders providing free financing for producers. I'd like perhaps not members of the panel, but other people in the audience to, e to elaborate on how these commercial companies see themselves providing a role in providing free financing to overcome supply side constraints in some of their countries. I'm thinking particularly in the, in the sugar sector. And to look at what challenges this, this throws up uh, as these big commercial companies get more involved in these direct relationships, particularly in the times of change in, in sectors like the sugar sector where everybody's having to adjust to very new market conditions. Thank you. There's somebody here on the left, a lady, yeah. I'll take this one, this one, and that one, yeah. Uh, my name is Isabel Saria from European Commission, DG Europe 8. I have a question concerning certification. Uh, how uh, can we be assured that uh, across the 60 countries that are covered by fair trade, certification works in a comparable way and that it corresponds really to the respect of uh, standards that uh, are necessary? Thank you. There's a, a lady here and then a gentleman there, and then we'll have to finish. Thank you. Um, Georgia Bernard, Embassy of Jamaica, Brussels. Um, my question concerns carbon miles. Uh, is the debate on carbon miles a disguised attempt to set up barriers to trade from developing countries? What if governments in developing countries sought to restrict imports from the north on the same principle? After all, the carbon emissions go in both directions. Could we hear from you, please? Thank you. Yeah, and I'd like to see us grow bananas and pineapples in England. <laughs> It'd be interesting to try. And somebody here at the back, yeah. I'll take those two, but very quickly, yeah, one, then the gentleman there, yeah. At the back first, then you, sir. Um, my name is Lutangu Mkuti. Uh, I'm a market specialist from uh, Commerce Secretariat uh, based in Zambia. 
My question is, uh, uh, I do believe that standards uh, are really cardinal in terms of uh, trade. Uh, as Comesa, we have, we're coming up with regional uh, standards. But my question, which I wanted to find out, because of our experiences where we find our people in terms of private sector, after they try to penetrate the European uh, market, then they face one or two difficulties. Do you have, uh, as a commission, of course, have uh, regional uh, uh, standards? Because we are coming up with our regional standards. So I think we would also want to be on board in terms of probably implementing this. So I wanted to find out probably in terms of area of regional standards of the commission, if you have any. Thank you. Finally, person here who, yes. Uh, yes. My name is George Alsey. I'm from the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, St. Lucia. Um, with regards to social premiums, in the presentation it was said that social premiums are used for the improvement of workers. Um, are there set guidelines by fair trade um, in terms of um, defining what is um, to be done in terms of improving workers? And then I'm, I'm very finally then, so you there. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I think uh, my, uh, my name is Ahmed Hussein from the Embassy of Sudan Economic Council. My question also focuses on the same issue that has been previously. This is the standard issue. Uh, as you know, that is uh, most of the uh, ACB countries and uh, also the developing countries are, uh, especially the producers, are from the small farmers and poor. And uh, one of the major issue that is encounters uh, their production is that is uh, the structural bottlenecks, uh, mainly uh, in the uh, uh, caused by the uh, product standards set up by the uh, uh, mark by the importing markets, which is uh, became a barrier for their uh, 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 for their trade. So in, in which capacity that is the EU? Because we know that the, the standards of the EU is different than the uh, codex of the, that's set up by, by the FAO. And uh, it's always uh, encounters with many problems that is for the producers is specifically on the grassroots levels so as to compete with this. To what levels that is the, uh, the EU? can uh, set up a mechanism rather than the technical assistant because we, we witness that the technical assistant doesn't work in a proper way. So is there any possibility to simplify and to make uh, these uh, standards more easier for the sake of, uh, of, of this production to be more competent and to be uh, more fair uh, within the fair trade? And thank you. Okay, I'm going to begin with... Um I think Gelta on some of the certification issues. The issue of, I think you're the best person. Does producer B, is, do other farmers meet the criteria but because they're not certified, they can't benefit? That was one question. The other question was about how do you know that the certification is the same in all the countries? And then um, I think some of the issues from you might suggest the issues from Sudan about the ability of farmers to meet the certification. Um, maybe also Mokta might want to say something about farmers meeting the, the certification barriers. Then we've got, we'll take the other questions then in a minute. Okay, so um, regarding the, the, this issue of having producers that fulfill the fertility standards but cannot, cannot access. Um, I'm not sure if they cannot access because they cannot pay the certification costs or which are the reasons behind because otherwise I wouldn't see why uh, they could not um, access the label and have access to this preferential market. Um, the second question on, on how we can guarantee that actually the certification is the same or that the, the label guarantees the same conditions in different countries is because we have an independent certification body that at the moment is the only body that does the certification but that may change in the future um, that does the certification and follows ISO, is certified according to ISO 65 which is the ISO standard for certification of products. So there's a guarantee of a third party independent verification scheme that the, com that the standards are being fulfilled all around the globe. And the third issue on the, worker, on, the, on the use of the social premium for the workers 
the premium has to be used um, for the social and economic development of the communities. So it is not any, any use of the premium that can be given and the, produce, the, the workers and the management, they have to have an assessment of which are the needs that are the, the ones that should be given the priorities they have that should be addressed to, to, um, through this fair trade premium. Okay, and then there was the issue of um, food miles. Are they discriminated? Is it a new, just an invented trade barrier? That was one question. I don't know who wants to respond to that. Democracy, you want to say something about barrier certification as well? And then there was a question to the Commission, I think, about the regional certification. You might, you might want to answer that one. Um, and I think then we covered all of them. So, Mokta, barriers trade for the producers. Uh, okay, President, I'm not sure that I've retained this point. The enfin, question itself. I wanted to focus more on the question of uh, the role, or at least the challenges that pose the intervention of societies multinational in the commerce equitable. Someone has posed it as a question at the entry. And it seems that this simply poses a problem of transparency. La question pour nous est de savoir, pour une société comme Nestlé ou une autre qui prétend faire du commerce équitable, dans quelle mesure est-ce que cela est vrai Est-ce qu'il rencontre, est-ce que il, 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 oui, tout, tout, tous les critères du commerce équitable font-ils travailler des communautés de base défavorisées Est-ce que les critères sont remplis Et qui contrôle tout ce processus Jusque-là, nous n'avons pas de réponse à, à, à toutes ces questions-là et je pense que c'est le défi majeur et c'est le problème essentiel que cela pose. Mais il faut savoir que c'est que le, le bout de la chaîne, finalement, le, euh, la société multinationale qui, qui certifie. Mais en définitive, lorsqu'on a affaire dans la distribution, cette fois, à une société comme Carrefour ou je ne sais pas quelle autre, nous avons affaire à une société multinationale aussi, qui intervient, mais dans la distribution. Dans quelles conditions euh, les, les, les contraintes du commerce équitable sont-elles posées à ces sociétés Ce sont également des défis qui nous sont posés et auxquels il faut... Je pense que nous trouvions une, une réponse. Si vous permettez, Madame la Présidente, je reviens juste un peu en arrière pour donner un exemple, parce qu'une question avait été posée sur le microcrédit ou l'accès au financement pour les organisations de producteurs. Pour donner juste un exemple, dans la fédération IFAT, il y a un partenaire stratégique, Shared Interest, qui est une fondation, je crois, de droit britannique, qui appuie les initiatives de commerce équitable dans les pays du Sud en mettant en place des lignes de financement qui peuvent aller jusqu'à 75% des commandes qui sont passées, si tant est que les deux parties, c'est-à-dire le producteur et l'acheteur, sont dans un même système, disons, de garantie et de certification, notamment IFAT. Si un producteur, membre de IFAT, reçoit une commande d'un acheteur de IFAT, la transaction peut se faire par shared interest et le préfinancement jusqu'à 75-80% des cas, souvent, sans coût additionnel pour le producteur, peut être obtenu. Je voulais donner cet exemple pour dire qu'en matière de microcrédit, il, il y a des choses qui sont faites. Je vous remercie. Mm -hmm. Nathalie, on the, on the food miles, is it just the trade barrier? Uh, yeah, um, I think that's an interesting one. And I think one interesting point to go along with that is that sometimes in developing countries, environmental standards are actually a lot better than in the developed countries. So even though the food may have travel, traveled further, the way it was produced was... Um, and it was done so in a more environmentally friendly way. So, for example, no pesticides used or no tractors. So I think that's an issue that, um, it, uh, that a lot of consumers aren't really aware of, but um, the retailers, or I think with the push for local foods, the retailers don't necessarily want to convey that message. Um, so it's a, it's a really touchy subject. And um, I think just another note I, I have about uh, choice editing. So what some supermarkets do, are they'll actually say well, we will not sell this fish anymore for example because it's not it wasn't farmed in an environmentally friendly way um, but with certain fair trade categories such as bananas and um, other fruits and vegetables I think these are things that consumers do demand and I don't think we'll, we'll see them coming off shelves anytime soon and finally the Commission on this issue of regional standards about people being given different standards to meet thank you um, I wasn't quite clear whether the question was on, on um, public standards or private standards, but just from the point of view of, of public standards, there is obviously just one set of, of standards applying to, to whether a producer is within the EU or outside the EU. 
So we don't have any specific standards assigned to specific groups of, of producers. Uh, then I think there, w there was this other question on, on um, um, sort of suggesting problems with, with the meeting standards, I think, came the, the last question that came up. And I think it's just quite important also to keep in mind that, in fact, the areas where you actually have the most interesting growth sometimes are in the areas where there is a lot of standards. It's just a, a, a thought to be put forth. You have that in, for example, flowers imports and so on. Uh, and that's an interesting issue as well to, to keep in mind. And again, these are then private standards rather than the, the public ones that have driven it. So it's a complicated issue. Okay, we're going to have to stop there. The speakers are here during the coffee break and some will be here for the rest of the morning, so you'll be able to ask them. There's an announcement before we break, though. So